university session. So we're not talking about you know, a document material that the Alliance has put out. We just make sure that okay, you know it's there, or why it's there, and how you can use it, etc. But I'll try to make it kind of concrete. Right? Because I know it is getting towards the end of the uh, session, so you know what it's like to get brain fatigue and all that. And um, as, as, as was mentioned, if questions in line would be great. I'll save some time at the end for questions as well. Uh, but this is this is really important. This is like this is the part that goes with a lot of what we're talking about. Right? We're talking about cloud, right? Um, it doesn't do much good. Well, it does some good, but it doesn't do the full amount of good if you've got cloud, but you don't have cloudware applications, right? It's like maybe a, you know, uh, there's a million examples, right? Of, you know, really expensive Formula One race car, and find someone who's only driven a, a Honda, right? Just saying, you know, good luck with the race, right? So. With this, I'll go through some specific things. I'd like to thank, you know, and before I go into I mean, this document, this work for a lot, a number of people from, you know, uh, the, from Disney, from Intel, from HP, from National Shire, right? So it's a lot of collective thinking. Uh, this is actually, the seed um, is actually, uh, you know, uh, in practice going through an organization that realized they needed to kind of do something about the DNA of the development staff, right? Because, I mean, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, there are some folks who just love technology, are always on the bleeding edge, and that's one major issue is to keep people away from just the bleeding edge all the time. But a lot of folks, it's a, you know, it's a day job, they come in, they've got a skill set, and don't necessarily um, keep themselves updated. So there's a, there's, a, there's a really important message in here is to one, know what it means, right? Some of the fundamental tenets for making an application cloudware, um, and two, to make sure you go through whether you're on the you know, a large enterprise, and you've got development staff in-house, right? How do you get them trained, right? Um, or if you're producing things. So, I'll go over the, you know, the principles of, of the cloud application architecture, design patterns, um, operational strategies, and to talk about hackathons. And I don't know if any of you got a chance to peek in, but in the other room, um, yesterday afternoon and this morning, we actually had a really nice session of folks who came in, and the idea was, can they quickly, in really less than two days, one afternoon plus one morning, um, make an application, right, that was a simple you know, client, uh, you know, front end, back end application that could be used for a charity, right? Um, and, you know, the idea was they got judged on how well they followed the, the, the tenets of being a cloud or app. So it was really putting it into practice. It was, a, it was a fun session. And these are things that are done not just here, but um, you know, Intel's had you know, great success doing them internally. That's something we probably heard about. So we'll talk a bit about that, and then I'll wrap up at the end. Just, re, just, just with the key messages, just as a recap, right? This is really, is, if, if nothing else, I hope you know. The only takeaway you get from this is that the document exists. Please check it out. And two, that you know, it, it is worth getting this into the DNA of your, uh, your developers if, if, if you have one. If, if you're going to do it as a So, um. I mean, this is kind of talking about the high level stuff, right? This is really saying uh, people debate whether something is evolutionary or revolutionary or transformational. Either way, this is something that is important, right? Um, it's really taking place, and there are actual teams doing this successfully. Um, they tend to get, you know, thought of as some of the newer you know, internet companies, startups, right? Where they just almost just natively just you know, write things this way and. I think many of us that have seen like kind of a traditional app versus a more modern app, just as a user experience of it, it's pretty clear right away when you do something to know if someone has written something right, with some of these principles or if they've completely forgotten their writing for it you know, 10 years ago. And even in large organizations, right, this only helps, right, making um, things, um, you know, scale better and, and be more efficient, etc. So let's just jump right into it. So I, I kind of already touched on the fact that it's, a, it's an opportunity for developers, right? Um, but I want to just actually get into the real content here. So this is a little bit broader than just, this is this, this part of the show here is a little bit broader than just showing what it's like from the app developer, right? But it does it does call out that in the beginning, right, in stage one, if you've got these, you've got like five levels of maturity for cloud, for enterprise cloud adoption. And of course, the end user, right? They might be at the beginning using some simple size, and it gets more, you know, complex and hybrid as it goes. IT operations is moving all the way to, you know, um, at the very end they get to a fully, you know, federated interoperable cloud. But the important part, really, in the middle for this topic for today, is just around what it, you know, what it really looks like for the app dev and the app owners, right? Because there's some 
some things you've got to navigate as you go through your maturity just around how do you play well with all of your legacy stuff because it's not going to go away, right? How do you, you know, obviously the topic we've had you know, on the truck here as well is these DevOps, right? How does that affect things? But you really just see you've got to kind of figure out how to best you know, work through those stages and it, the, the, the target really is to get to where the majority of your portfolio, where it can be, where it can be changed, is, is Cloudware working nicely with your legacy apps, right? And it's, it's, to be honest, not a small thing. That's outside of the scope of this particular um, topic. I just want to call out that that is, you're just being realistic, that's something you're going to have to deal with. But today I'm just going to start with just what are the things that would make something, you know, Cloudware. Uh, quick history, right, recap, right? We've gone from, you know, the, the traditional, you know, multi-tiered architecture. Um, to virtualize things. When we did virtualize things, it didn't really change things much. It was just really taking that first, that first um, item and just replicating it onto VMs, right? Um, but here we want to move things towards actual cloud app architecture. This is the main picture. Um, if this is the only thing you know that you, could, you know the only visual that you, you know you take away from this particular presentation, um, it's important, right? Because it covers all the aspects in one piece. And it just shows a before and after, right? On the left, right, it is that traditional multi-tiered app where, for the most part, they were a relatively fixed number of things that were considered a client, right? Whether it's a, you know, a desktop or laptop, you know, early, early apps on mobile phones, etc. Most of the transactions were, were typically um, synchronous, right? Like if it was a web request, someone would make an HTTP request, you know, wait, maybe have a timeout. If the timeout didn't happen, right, then it would just in a lot of cases, you know, really ugly error message, right? And that's not a great user experience, right? Um, the, on the back end, right, it was a very relatively fixed environment. There was a load balancer. That load balancer was very often manually configured. Um, it actually specifically balanced between, you know, uh, you know either, you know, if it was nice, it was, if it was a VIP, otherwise it was fixed IP addresses. It was kit that was wrapped and stacked for that back end application. Yeah, I think everyone here probably gets that drill, right? And the perimeter itself was also manually created. That's that green line around the outside. So that was the world we all know and love. And flipping forward to, to the present, where we want things to be, with the cloud that we're at, the first change, of course, is, is all of the things that you know, define what a client is, right? And it's everything from what we had before um, to the addition of you know, so-called wearables, right, the Internet of Things, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot more things in play. Um, I know I personally do a whole lot of East West Coast frying, so I'm pretty, pretty uh, almost demanding now when I'm running apps that if I get a really, really narrow bandwidth on the plane that I'm expecting things to still work and fail for Israel, right? So I mean, maybe that's been a little bit, a little bit greedy, but it kind of drives on the point that, you know, you don't know where someone's going to be, what they're coming from, how bad the bandwidth is going to be, uh, or you know, whatever it is, anything, right? And then, so the idea is plan for that, design for that, be aware that that's, you know, um, what you're dealing with on who's using your app or where they're from, where you're using it from. And then consider that, you know, the, the, the everything moves from being typically synchronous to typically asynchronous, right? And on top of that, right, to just keep the efficiency in play, right, um, you know, making use of, you know, caching and um, collapsing, right, the idea is, you know, Send as little information back and forth as possible. Don't repeat information you don't want to send, etc. Another one, I think it might be hard, I'm not sure if that font is easy to read or not in, in, the, in, the, um, in some of those black boxes, but underneath the caching and collapsing, there's a bit around um, API management queuing, right? Because as, a, as an, app, an app developer, you never want to be back where you're just sending a request, sending some arbitrary time out there, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and if it doesn't come back, that's it. Um, or if it does go, you have no idea. So you want to, we want to manage things for, for, for multiple aspects. Two of the important ones are queuing, right? Put something in a queue, let queue management figure out whether that actual request has been handled or not. Uh, also, you want to know if that queue is going to be able to tell you that the queue is getting too full. Maybe, maybe it gets you know, um, sent somewhere else for, for handling. And API management is important in the context, not just of, of the cloud, but we talk about DevOps and delivering content more quickly. Um, it's probably not going to be feasible to say, hey, well, then we can learn something every two weeks, every one of our sprints, we have a new application. Hey, on Friday night at 6, everyone stop using our stuff. We're going to update it. Um, and that can now be, you know, you can't, we can't do that. So there's going to be this, you know, expectation. You should assume that there's going to be 
multiple versions of your services with multiple APIs out front, and you want some kind of API manager that can intelligently route the request coming in, know which version of the client is coming in, right? know where to route that to, etc. So you can have simultaneous, right? And this makes things a lot easier for sustaining engineering. So that's really all on the, on the client side, getting stuff in, and then of course there's a, you know, the, the cloud itself has given us all these nice changes um, on the back end, right? So we move away from you know, that green fixed perimeter, so now we've got a dynamic perimeter, right? All of the, you know, the typical things are virtualized, you know, network functions are virtualized, many things are you know, virtualized, and they're dynamic, right? We don't expect it to be Friday night at 7 and someone's going to go to change a firewall rule, right? If they get it wrong, they have to wait until next Friday night, like we used to do you know, five years ago, ten years ago. All this should be automated. Um, the load balancer is, is, is more at the level work load placement manager. What would you want to call a cloud manager, a cloud broker, etc. It's something that's smart enough to know where to put the workload. So again, these are at the bottom of this. These are all cloud topics, not specifically the topic of this particular um, presentation. But the fact that you know, if you're developing a cloudware app, you have to be aware of you know what these changes are. And the you know. Uh, You'll see some of the tenets as I, as I go through the slides around not you know, being agnostic to where the workload is. You never want your workload to, to have any real affinity to any particular kit. It doesn't make any sense. You want to be agnostic. You, you, you don't want to care about that. Um, you should expect that things are going to be scalable. Um, you, know, you should also, in, in an ideal sense, expect that your stuff can be um, failed around easily. Right? So if you're running parts of this on the back end, um, you'd hate to ever have, you know, today we know what happens if there's a production server and there's an outage, right? We actually stop things, open a ticket, trouble, say, you know, someone goes in, SSHs in or whatever, it doesn't have forensics and tries to troubleshoot the app. Um, it would be much better if we didn't really have to care about production apps because why would, why would an app care about one server or one VM or whatever? So if your app is designed to fail around, right? And so, I mean, there are some things that the infrastructure can do to compensate for an app that hasn't been there this way. But it makes it a whole lot easier and more trustable if your app actually you know, knows that it could be um, failing around, right? And then on the bottom there, it might be hard to see it as well. But you know, we've got a couple more options on storage, right? It's not just the fact that we've got you know um, NAS or SAN and some kind of fixed storage. We've got um, you know cloud storage. It's, it's you know it's either file or, or it's objects, right? Um, and all of that is, is something to be aware of. You should know if you're making a request for um, some kind of data in your application, you should know in your design whether it's going to be you know, object-based or not. And the, the, the last piece of this picture is kind of hidden, you know, it's kind of on the side there, but it's really, really important. And I was actually really happy to hear, you know, I got mentioned a couple of times, including Shannon in the keynote just now, you know, mentioned even within the hardware having a lot of instrumentation, a lot of you know, metrics coming out. That's something that can't be understated um, or said too many times. We know that a lot of times developers um, kind of get into this, uh, what I call circle back syndrome, meaning they'll code the happy path for something and say, I'll come back to that and I'll do the proper error checking, I'll do the instrumentation, and of course, schedules get busy, you know, managers start going, customers start going. Um, so the idea here is just to make sure that whether it's you know, in the platforms that you're using, maybe it's already baked into a, you know, to a platform you're using, or if you're, you know, if you need to add the metrics yourself, that it's in your design, and you do it in the beginning um, as part of the application development. It's not something you add on after. So that's a really, really important part. So, question? Yes. So this is not about monitoring. Well, it actually it overlaps. To be honest, it does overlap with monitoring. But this is the idea of saying if you're the application. And you're, and you're coding it, you, you have a special uh, advantage of putting some instrumentation in that might be hard to get from a monitoring that has to interrogate after the fact. Right? That's the only, it's making it easier for, you know, it's complementary, it's probably the best way. So this would connect with monitoring. Yeah. I mean, a little bit outside of the scope of this particular part, but it's, it's just knowing that there's instrumentation in there because there are options, I and mean, you could say that. You know, you instrument just enough. I think even Shannon just mentioned this previously. You can instrument enough that that triggers the workflow that might do a failover, or that might do a self heal, or might do something, right? So that, and then you don't really need monitor. If you don't, then you're just monitoring the system that does the healing. You don't have to monitor the system that's going to fail over. You just, that's like an audit. It's a log file. You say it happens, but I took care of it, right? So it kind of blurs the line a little bit between monitoring and operational workflow automation. 
So, I mean, these are these are the really these are the big ones, right? Um, things that I, you know, you just can't say enough that every you know, if you've got a, a dev team, you know, make sure this is all this is like memorized back of hand by. Some of these should be they're just good practices, right? I mean, these are probably things we should be doing all along anyway. Uh, but this is just say in a cloud aware app. You know, make sure these are always there, right? So resistance to failure is is pretty straightforward, right? But um, these these interplay, right? So resistance to failure has aspects of the fact that you know, let's say I've got a huge amount of latency because I am on the plane, right? And I make a request and then we fly through a, a you know a dead zone and there's no connection. You know, how does the client side handle that gracefully? Um, right? I, 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 hopefully my whole app doesn't just go away and crash. Um, but one of the classic early examples here, right, is you know, we all know that Netflix did a great job on some of this, right? And this touches on the, the bottom left, the the, uh, the uh, composability of things, right? So the developing pieces, right? I mean, we've always wanted to evolve um, reusing code, reusing stuff, right? SOA isn't new, but the idea here is that maybe you've, you've got things written in multiple pieces that if one fails, right, you can still serve the other, right? So Netflix is a classic example where maybe they have a problem with their, um, you know, the ratings, right? How many people rated this movie, right? Do they like it or not? But if that system fails, I don't want to see the, the whole screen go blank or have an error. I want to say, fine, show me the movies. I can still pick and still watch movies. I just don't know how it was rated. That's just one example, right? So that's that's really important it's just to, you know, have these things all tied together, right? So that you build things, um, so that if one fails, right, there's still a meaningful um, experience for the user. And um, location independence is an important one. Um, the data, right, has policies. The data should be taken care of where it lands. Right? The data has jurisdictional restrictions. But you as an app developer should not say my app is going to behave differently right, depending on where I'm sitting and which data center that. So you should make sure you're just agnostic to that. And all that is an extension to me, have your workload be, you know, no affinity between your workload and, and the actual kit that it's running on. Um, security, that should go without saying. That's kind of the same thing as instrumentation, right? Uh, just really make sure that, you know, the developer teams, um, you know, Either have the right oversight within your organization, right, to do checks and balances and make sure the security is in there, but that it's actually put in there from the beginning, right? Some additional ones, right, um, you know, they're listed as medium and lower priority, but again, this might depend on your, your context, right? But it's designed for manageability, right? Because, I mean, it's, you know, if you go with, you know, dev ship and run, somebody's got to run your app, right? So this would be nice if you're the dev, uh, the app dev team. You know, to make stuff that is you know easily manageable, right? And a lot of what that would mean is probably also easily automatable, right? So it doesn't have to have um, a lot of hands-on, ideally no hands-on. Um, we talked a bit about infrastructure independence. Uh, defined tendency is an important one. You can't decide after the fact whether you're going to be um, a single tenant app or a multi-tenant app. It's non-trivial, so they can truly non, truly multi-tenant app. So if you're a service provider, you better know if you're going to have multiple parties involved who may dislike each other, mistrust each other, want to get each other's data, whatever it is. You need to know that up front and design accordingly. Um, we just, you know, the reason this is called out here is we've seen a lot of traditional apps that really just don't even ask the question. They just design and say, well, you know, I, I, I'm a front end and a back end, and you know, maybe they're able to figure out how to make it you know, multi tenant. Um, and the last one is important, the, the, the cost of resource consumption aware, right? I mean, this, is just the, this is just the classic, it's not just what's the best performance, what's the, the sexiest solution, it's just, you know, balancing everything, right? Just making sure that where you, you know, what you use, right, um, manages, the balances time and, you know, and cost, right, and complexity. This is an example, this is a real, a real excerpt from, from what's been done within Intel, right? Um, by having a rating system, right, uh, you know, a, a, a cloud star criteria, right, so that they can go through applications and you can see, I'll read it out because I think that font is really small, right, but requirement one is the application is resilient to, you know, to failure and latency, right. Um, number two is the application is not tied to specific infrastructure. This is just in practice going through and looking at stuff that's actually been developed and rating it. Is it, is it cloud or should we, should we be, you know, is there something we can change about this to make it better for the cloud? 
So I think that's great. I'd love to see you know as many organizations as possible kind of follow that example right there. So I still design patterns. Um, we've the the paper itself. Again, getting back to the university part of this presentation. If you look at the paper, it has picked out nine um, nine key design patterns. This is these are things that you know, the OCA believes that you know, all of your app dev teams should be very very familiar with. I'm going to go through just three of them. And by the way, the, the paper picked nine. There's certainly more than nine in the world. There are more than nine things you can do today with cloud-aware applications. But these are important ones. And we'll go through three of them right now. Um, the first one, this, this really just kind of ties together the things I've already, I've already just said. Um, this certainly wasn't new just because of um, Netflix, but they made it very well known because they are very kind to us in the industry by blogging very you know, openly about what they do, the values they've had, right? When things didn't work or when they didn't work, right? So on this, the flow actually goes from that top left, right? Where, um, and step one, someone actually makes a request, and the, the next two boxes say that it can either be synchronous or asynchronous, right? But then there's this concept of circuit breaker, and, and really, just to simplify this illustration, all that circuit breaker is, is there's just some software intelligence, right, that just says, um, what's the status of you know, with this request when it comes in, I know where it's going to land. Is the service where it's going to land? Is it actually operational now, um, or is it? You know, is it? Is, is the queue filling up where it's getting too busy and I should actually you know, not put more stuff into the queue, or is it in a fail state? And if it's a fail state, that gives um, the response and then your your client application the chance to do something meaningfully about it. You can either. Um, you know, fail gracefully. Ideally, you would just fail that one little piece. We talked about you know, composability. You fail that one piece, and you're still keep on with everything else. Um, or you present an alternate option. Right. So this alone, um, and, and what's nice about this is, if you've ever seen the um, the dashboard they have, this actually makes it really nice to have huge, you know, internet scale uh, service status at the individual um, method call. Because they they'll, they'll, they'll have a you know a chart that literally shows the current you know transaction rate going through the circuit, what the circuit is open, what percentage of the transactions were failures or not. So you not only get better end user um, experience because of something like this, but your visibility, right? Because I mean, you know, I think most of us would probably agree that 10 years ago you did, probably didn't have good visibility into whether specific API calls were working, how often they were working, how slow they were taking, right? So this is this is really, really nice to have for a number of reasons, right? Uh, and, and if you haven't seen, you know, um, just even the dashboard around this, right? It's great. It's great to look at. It's real time, right? Um, the next one here is stateless. I'm gonna say this is really really important. Uh, it's again like all these. These are just good practices that we should have been doing in IT all along. But this is especially you know, to make this really really simple. If you've got something that's going to be elastically like, scalable, there, you know, that said, say the compute's elastically scalable. Um, you really can't have a state stuck with one particular node, right? Because if the client does step one, right, and then has a, a subsequent step, and it gets routed to a second or different instance, right, it doesn't, you know, you don't want to be in the business of having to put some kind of client or session token and doing some backend look up to some shared memory in the backend. It just makes a whole lot more sense just to have every request come in contain all the information you need, everything is stateless, and that puts a lot less um, importance on the actual kit that you can fail away, you can fail around, you can do whatever you want, right? So this is really important um, just to make, you know, um, just, like I keep saying, in, in the DNA of developers, just make sure that things are, you know, um, stateless as they write them. In REST, everyone loves REST, right? REST is, uh, you know, a really great way to do that. Um, authorization patterns are important. Um, because security is obviously important in this. And this is just one example, but the main point here really is just showing that A, you're separating out you know, the authorization from the authentication, right? Um, and this allows some things that might, be, might not be obvious just from this picture right here. I mean, we, we all know that people complain about passwords, you know, social engineer things, and there's a lot of trouble with passwords. Um, but if you separate out your authentication service, uh, you can start, at some point, at least your position to be taking advantage of the, the newer things that um, people are doing around authentication. Just a simple example would be, you know, some of the, you know, some of the uh, cell phone companies, right? They know just from the fact you've got your phone on you, 
you generally know where you are, right? They can do things. Some of the phones, as you know, you can do, you know, uh, you can touch and get fingerprints. Um, the idea is that where you are, and depending on how important the transaction is, like if it's a really important transaction, like you're taking a lot of money out of your bank, it might be good to have like, you know, three or four or five form authentication, meaning, hey, are you actually you know, in your home country or your home city? Right? If it's a really important transaction, you can bump it up to say, hey, maybe I want a fifth form of authentication. You can even call you on your phone or get voice recognition. So these are things that are practically in the field now, but they are absolutely being worked on pretty actively. So the idea here is that you just kind of separate that out in your, in your design and expect that you want to take advantage of a lot more choices than just passwords, right, for your authentication. It's worth looking at that. Um, and then, of course, you just want to make sure your design pattern um, accounts for the fact that if you're scaling out multiple servers, or you're scaling out storage, right, that you don't have issues with the session and the user being able to get to the storage, right, it should be seamless for the end user. So, in some ways, it's easier to say this stuff. There's, it's not trivial to do some of it, but it's, it's, it really is important for the end user. Right? So those are just three of the um, actual patterns. I, just, you know, I want to make sure we call those out. Um, please, you know, please look at the document for the other for the other six. They are really helpful. Um, this one here uh, kind of just, it, it in some ways, restates that original illustration from a few slides back on the maturity model. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I just want to call out that this is material that's in the actual document. It's worth, it's worth reading through because you know, it's one thing to say, let's get this into your developer's DNA. Um, it's also really important, especially if, you know, for, for management, to know well, how, how tracking how we're doing, right? I mean, you know, what's the state of our, of our, of our dev team, right? Are they, are they getting stages are they getting better at it, right? So operational strategies, right? Um, uh, I'm not going to go through all these. This is a screenshot from, from sections of the actual document here. But just pulling out the important ones, right? Um, I'm going to skip to the lower left. I mean, this is something we all know, and hopefully, at least even from the three days here, we've heard in the fact that there's things like availability zones, right? Or, or places where, you know, it's all, you know, if you put everything in one basket, put all your eggs in one basket, that goes away, you know. If, if you, as the app developer, didn't know about that, right? If you decided, if you weren't even aware of things like that, that availability zones, right, and didn't account for that, and where you placed your, your stuff, that would be considered um, a, you know, a bad cloud-aware application, right? And I think we probably remember from your company, or maybe, maybe five years ago, four years ago, I don't know it was, when there was a whole question, was the cloud ready for prime time, and there was some big high-profile outages, but when you kind of dug past the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the um, sensational headlines, right? It, 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 for by and large, not in every case, there were certainly cases where cloud service providers had some hiccups, but a lot of times they ended up just being that the actual app developers just didn't you know, write proper cloud aware architectures, right? For the design. So that's important just to, just to make sure you are aware of, of your zones. And that one is also talking about, um, it, it actually mentions specifically just that you've got latency between zones. I mean, these, are, these zones are actually in many cases, uh, you know, actual data centers. So you do have to be you know, aware of what it takes to get you know, stuff back and forth. So it's, it's something just to keep in mind. Um, I mean, the, the second one at the bottom is important too. It's secure access to APIs. Right? A lot of times people would have a website and they have a login name and password and you can use the application, but then the APIs are left wide open, which kind of makes no sense. Right? Um, so this is just basically saying, <laughs> should have any person or any machine get authenticated to use your system, right? It's kind of a no-brainer, but it got overlooked a lot of times. That's why it's on here, it's just to make sure that when you do Cloudware apps, and that's, that's included. Um, there's the, the, the abstracted uh, dependencies, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. That one is a good practice. The best practice has been around for, forever, right? We don't want to, you know, we, we always think about abstraction, right? Just make sure that the other teams are doing it. The, the, the last one on the bottom, right? Um, this is, you know, this is just one one approach you can have. This is where if you've got a lot of um, high bandwidth consumers, right, you might not want to have them all be throttled through one single gateway. Right? Maybe you've got, you know, an on, you know, the enterprise, you know, corporate network and some resources on the outside. Right. So this is just saying, keep in mind and think that, you know, there may be um, times when you want to kind of do more of a. It's not pure computers on the right one. The idea is you don't want to. Over 60 apps, right? So 
I mean, this is probably like the most straightforward way of just bringing awareness within your organizations, right? Um, getting people to actually do it. Because it's one thing, this is probably something you never want to do as mentor training, right? The real compliance zero training is boring. No one's going to pay attention, right? But doing it this way, right, is really hands on, right? It's a great way just to say um, that, you, that, you, that you've got people thinking in terms of maybe cloud aware apps. Um, this is the one I just talked about. This actually happens here um, today, you know, today's. And so, really, that's, that's it. I, you know, I wanted to.